So you have an acute DVT. That's also known as an acute deep venous thrombosis. What that is is a blood clot in your vein and either your arm or your leg. Typically it's in your leg. Uh, the clot is made up of tiny little particles called fibrin and red blood cells that over time will become more and more dense and will likely obstruct your vein, causing your vein no longer to be open and could cause swelling or even pain with prolonged standing uh, six months to a year after you recover from this event. At Stanford, we've pioneered a number of technologies where we go in uh, with minimally invasive techniques using basically an IV catheter into the back of your knee if we're going to treat your leg and figure out exactly where the clot is how long the clot is, how big the clot is, and then we have a couple of different devices that will, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, rotor rooter out the clot. We also will give you um, typically a, a lytic. Uh, most commonly it's TPA, also it's manufactured by Genentech, and you can visit their website for more information. If the clot is extensive, we place a catheter right into the clot and drip the TPA into the clot over a period of one to two days. During that time you're allowed to drink water but you're confined to uh, the bed and we have you in a step-down unit so that they can monitor you. After we have uh, cleared out the clot and then we have identified the narrowing in your vein, the uh, next step will be to place a stent inside your vein. And a stent is a tiny little mesh tube that's compressed on a little catheter that we insert very de delicately into the vein and put it in the right location and then we deploy it and it'll open up and what that does is holds open the walls of the vein. We then, as soon as the stent opens, we then will go in with an angioplasty balloon to expand it a little bit more to give it really a perfect result. Now that uh, stent will stay in your body forever the stent um, helps us keep the vein open so that you don't develop further clots later. Once you have received the treatment and you've had the stent, you'll go on a blood thinner for anywhere from six months to one year, depending on the etiology of your DVT. If we're concerned that you may clot off after we stop the blood thinner, we will discuss with you and with your treating physician and possibly also a hematologist whether you need to be on blood thinners for a longer period of time. And that's something we make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. What if I decide to have this procedure done and I'm already taking a blood thinner medication? So if you decide to have this procedure done, uh, typically what happens is if you're on a blood thinner such as Coumadin, we need to have you stop the Coumadin five days before you're going to have the procedure and we'll start you on low molecular what weight heparin. Typically jail? we use Lovenox and that's two injections, uh, one in the morning and one at night and that keeps your blood thin up until the procedure. You'll take your last injection the night before you have the procedure. Once you're in the hospital we're equipped to thin your blood with either that type of medication or um, heparin. After the procedure is done, we will transition you back to low molecular weight heparin or Lovenox and you will administer those shots to yourself and then you will start the Coumadin and typically we want to have your Coumadin in a range between the uh, INR between 2 and 3. In some instances uh, we may recommend that you have it higher depending on what the etiology was or the cause of your DVT. After the procedure is completed, what should I expect? Immediately after the procedure when you go home, it's important to keep your leg or if it's your arm elevated above the level of your heart. And it's also important to wear the compression stockings that we prescribe for you. It are these two things that will help your leg or your arm decrease in size more quickly than if you do not do them. We will follow you up typically around one month and then six months and then at 12 months. The, uh, there is an opportunity or, or risk that the stent that we place into your body could get clogged up and there are no drugs that can be put on these stents to prevent the clogging like there, are, there have been developed in the heart. The risk of these uh, stents from clogging really depends on a, a number of factors. 
um, that is individualized and we can discuss this uh, at your clinic visit. What happens if my leg begins to swell while I'm at home? When you're at home, you notice your leg swelling gets worse or the pain in your leg starts to get worse. That's when you need to call our clinic and we will pre we'll prescribe a CAT scan for you to see whether or not the stents have clogged as well as a clinic visit so that we can evaluate you. And the most important thing in this therapy is that you have an appropriate monitoring schedule by your primary care doctor for the blood thinners. And remember, we will give you the target range for your INR, typically between 2 and 3, but in some cases as high as 3.5 for you. And it's imperative that you and your primary care physician work together to keep your blood thin so that the stents do not clot off. What are the risks involved with this procedure? The main risks of this procedure is probably bleeding. Anytime we go into a patient's body with any instrument, no matter how small, there's a risk of bleeding. With the use of TPA, the risk of bleeding can increase. And the bleeding risk is about a 2 to 5 percent risk of having a major bleed. And that's when we would treat you with a blood transfusion. There's also a very, very small risk that you could have a bleed into your brain, and that would be a stroke. However, there's only two reported instances out of 753 cases that are in the literature of people having that type of complication. And so the complication of a bleed into your brain is very, very rare. After the procedure is completed, how long will I experience pain for? You may, after the stent has been implant, implanted, experience some low back pain. And this typically resolves within one to two weeks. The pain is typically mild and best treated with Advil or uh, Tylenol. What are the benefits of having this treatment done? The main benefit is that the vein will not be blocked. And it's important to let you understand exactly what a blocked vein would do to your lifestyle. Some patients tolerate a blocked vein relatively well with minimal s symptoms. Other patients, however, report that they're no longer able to work or run or stand for extended period of times. And that's because the blood is unable to get out of the leg and back to the heart. So uh, at this point we have not developed any uh, classification system for those patients that would be able to do okay with a block vein versus those that would not do well with a block vein. So what we do is we do a CAT scan which you will either have uh, prior to your visit um, or you may already have had to really look at how long the clot is. And in the clots that are very long, as I said earlier, those are the ones that we tend to treat with this minimally invasive therapy. So you have a chronic DVT. You're probably aware of what a chronic DVT is, but let me review that. You initially, maybe four months ago, a year, or even 25 years ago, developed a blood clot, an acute DVT, deep venous thrombosis, in your vein. And over time, this clot has become more and more uh, solidified in your vein and has damaged the vein as well as the valves that are in your vein. Typically, patients that have the most uh, severe symptoms in terms of swelling or pain withstanding the vein is completely blocked. And what we do here at Stanford is we offer a minimally invasive procedure that is able to open the blocked vein. We're probably the only center, or one of the only centers in the country that offers this procedure. We term it a venous reconstruction. You typically will come to clinic, we'll examine you, look at your legs or look at your arms, and then also get a CAT scan to evaluate exactly what portions of your veins are occluded. We'll discuss with you the appropriate treatment plan, which typically includes doing a venogram where we will take a IV and put it into your vein and inject dye to really delineate the exact extent of the blockage and correlate that with the CAT scan. And then we use uh, tiny little wires and tiny little catheters to get through the blocked vein. Once we get through the blocked vein, we'll implant a stent. And a stent is a metal tube that's made out of mesh. It stays in your body forever. And we put it into the blocked vein and open it up. 
and then after it's open we go in with an angioplasty balloon and open it up a little bit more so in essence we're creating a new pathway for your blood flow out of your leg or out of your arm these procedures can be very challenging depending on the extent and length of the blockage some procedures are as quick as 45 minutes to an hour. Other procedures may take eight or nine hours. It really depends on where the blockage is located and how long of a blockage there is. In some instances, approximately 10%, we're unable to get through the blockage safely and so we have to stop the procedure. But in the 90, other 90% 90 of the cases, we're able to get through the blockage and open it up and provide relief for the patients. Now, the relief that the patients experience is significant, but we're never able to get them back to their baseline level of, of functionality or symptomatology that they experience prior to their first DVT. What are the risks involved with this procedure? The risks of the procedure are small, but important to discuss. They include bleeding, infection, injury to blood vessels or adjacent organs. The bleeding risk is about 1% and it's typically treated with a blood transfusion. Infection rate is less than 1% and injury to adjacent organs is again less than 1%. The main risk is that we'll go in and try and get through the blockage but be unsuccessful and this occurs in 10%. However, patients that were unsuccessful in uh, crossing the blockage those patients have not reported increased pain or symptomatology from the intervention. What are the benefits of having this procedure done? The benefits, however, is that if we are able to open up this vessel and provide blood flow out of your arm or out of your leg, you will notice a significant improvement in your level of pain or swelling. Now, every patient responds differently to the stenting, and there's no way to be able to tell you that you'll get 30% better, 50% better, 80% better, and I've had some patients say 97% better. It's really individualized and something that we don't know until we've treated the patient. What if I'm on blood thinners prior to this procedure? So if you decide to have this procedure done, and you are currently on blood thinners such as Coumadin, you're going to need to stop your Coumadin five days before the procedure and go on low molecular weight heparin. We typically use Lovenox and the Lovenox will keep your blood thin up until the time of the procedure. Make sure your last dose is the night before you have your procedure. Once you have the procedure, then afterwards we'll discuss the appropriate anticoagulation schedule. Almost always patients go back on Lovenox for a period of five days while we restart the Coumadin with a target INR anywhere between 2 and 3.5 and that's something that we will discuss with you uh, after the procedure is finished. It's also important to know that there is a risk that these stents could either clot off in the short term and the patients that have that um, adverse event are patients that typically have not been taking their Lovenox or their Coumadin. So it's important that you keep your INR elevated and if your INR is not in the target range that you continue on the Lovenox. How long will the stent remain open? The other issue is how long do these stents stay open? And really there's not any great data for patients that have had chronic uh, DVT and then a stent placed. What I tell most patients is that about one year 80 to 90 percent of the stents are still open. Once we get out to three years, it's more around 70 to 80 percent. So we're continuing to investigate this and track our outcomes, but that's the best available data to date. After you've had the stent put in place, you need to wear your compression stockings and stay on your blood thinners. If you notice that you have pain or swelling in your leg or your arm, or if you have a fever, you need to call our office for a clinic visit.